We'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce the chair of this panel who put the panel together and is running it. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce him because when I became dean, I needed to find someone to take over the Cox International Law Center, which Layla had mentioned has been a real part of the success of our law school. In fact, the Cox Center, as you see on that banner there, is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. And so our chair is is also the director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center. He was the head of Baker Hostetler's international law practice. He's been teaching at our law school for many years. He has been the chair of the Greater Cleveland International Lawyers Group, the Cleveland Council on World Affairs, the Great Lakes Council, and many other organizations. In fact, he's an organizational guru, and so we're so lucky to have him running ours. This is Steve Petrus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, so, as Professor Murphy stated, on February 24, 2022, the Russian military entered the Ukraine with troops, tanks, artillery, aircraft, and other weapons and started firing on Ukrainian military and civilian personnel and targets. Russia had been building up its forces for a number of months in advance of this action and had, in fact, denied intentions to attack. Before this invasion and through press releases and speeches after it, President Vladimir Putin justified this action for essentially five reasons. One, concerns over NATO's eastward expansion. Two, claims that the Ukraine was committing genocide against Russians. Three, claims that Ukraine isn't a real country. Four, concerns over nuclear weapons. Ukraine had housed nuclear weapons in the past, and he argued that they had knowledge to develop or get them. And five, a desire to build back or preserve a Russian empire. And we've seen evidence of that yesterday. Although other nations were confounded by this action, and many joined the US and Europe to impose economic sanctions and help arm the Ukraine's military, the atrocities were still staggering. The loss of innocent lives, exposure, to exposure of criminal behavior. Uh, the losses are not detailed, we've had estimates, but they're staggering, as is the torture, executions, detentions, coercions, destructions, are terrible and shocking. And this all happened in 2022. Even though all nations, including Russia, more than 50 years ago, signed on to the UN Charter and other treaties that promised not to attack another country. And this all happened long after the end of the Cold War. So what happened to the commitments of having a world free of war crimes, especially in Europe? And what can be done about it? Here to help us understand is an outstanding panel of legal experts who will look at the role of international law in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Our panelists consist of Michael J. Kelly, professor, Creighton University School of Law, Rebecca Hamilton, Assistant Professor, American University, Washington College of Law, Lori Blank, Clinical Professor, Emory University School of Law, Jennifer Trahan, Clinical Professor, New York University Center for Global Affairs, and Chiara Giorgetti, Professor, University of Richmond School of Law. I will inter introduce each panel and each will give a precise presentation on particular aspects of these issues. Then I will have one follow-up question for each of them, and after that, we will open it up to questions from the audience. So let's get started. First, Michael J. Kelly, Professor Creighton University School of Law. Professor Kelly coordinates the International and Comparative Law Program at Creighton University School of Law, including its nationally recognized summer school program on international law and the Holocaust in Germany, from Nuremberg to The Hague. 
He is currently the president of the U.S. National Chapter and currently a member of the Board of Directors of L'Association Internationale de Droit Penal. He is the author and co-author of seven books and over 40 articles and widely cited and is among the top three downloads from the Social Science Research Network. Professor Kelly consulted with the Kurdish Regional Government on Federalism and Constitutional Law. Uh, he's the corresponding editor for the American Society of International Law's flagship publication, International Legal Materials. And he's a member of the President's Advisory Committee on Global Engagement for American for the American Association of Law Schools. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. And welcome, everyone, to our first panel. Uh, my task today is to frame a bit uh, for the rest of what's going to be discussed on our first panel, which will in turn frame a bit for the other panels uh, in their talks today. And uh, my task is to look at the role of public international law in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. And I'll begin with the observation that I make um, in the article that I just submitted uh, to next year's journal. International law ends where real politique begins. And let that sink in for a minute. Um, the reason I make that observation is to insert a little bit of realism into what oftentimes those of us in the International Legal Academy approach in a starry-eyed way of all of the things we can do with international law. We have to be a bit realistic about the functions of our field. Um, I first want to discuss a bit uh, about Vladimir Putin's playbook before I get into the two strands of public international law that give you examples of, on the one hand, a failure, and on the other hand, a success uh, in this area. Much has been played uh, up about Putin's playbook going into uh, Ukraine, and by his playbook, uh, we talk about his legal playbook, his international legal playbook that really functions as an international legal pirouette uh, worthy of a matinee at the Bolshoi, twisting international law in certain ways as to justify his entrance into Ukraine. The first step, denial that Ukraine was even a real country prior to Russia's recognition of it. The second step, recognition of new independent states dominated by Russian-speaking inhabitants emerging from Ukrainian territory. The third step, allegation of atrocities committed upon those Russian-speaking people by Ukrainian forces. The fourth step, requests for military assistance by the governments of these newly recognized entities uh, and then deployment of Russian forces in response to those requests. Ultimately, this ends with annexation, and that's happening today, as Dean Scharf noted. Um, but where did he get this playbook? Uh, it's not new. We saw it play out in Crimea in the 2014-2015 period. So this is really a rehash. We should not at all be surprised about this. Um, comparisons have rightly been made to Germany using this playbook in 1938, right? And the Sudetenland, saving German-speaking peoples uh, from the abusive Czechs. But I think we need to go a little bit further back in time. Uh, and we need to be more clear-eyed about who penned the first draft of this playbook. Uh, if you go back and look at the sequence of events uh, from the 1890s to the early 1900s with the United States and Hawaii, all of those elements are in place. Denial of Hawaii's existence as an independent entity before we recognized it in the 1840s, uh, the consolidation of American corporate interests there in the 1870s and 1880s, allegations of abuse by Americans, by Hawaiian authorities in the 1890s, overthrow of the queen, setting up a separate government uh, in an independent state controlled by the Dole family, Sanford Dole, the request for assistance, which was then granted by the U.S. military, landing Marines from the USS Boston in Honolulu, uh, and then absorption, right, 
as a territory, ultimately on the road to annexation in 1952. When American chickens come home to roost, uh, sometimes they do so in unfortunate ways. And I think we need to be clear-eyed about this. Now, with respect to public international law, failing and succeeding in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, on the failure side of the equation, uh, we have collective security arrangements. Three versions, global, regional, and local. On the success side of the ledger, we have international judicial processes. So on the failure side first, uh, the global collective security arrangement we all know is the UN Security Council. Uh, it has worked in the past in grand ways. You know, we think of uh, the Korean War, we think of the first Iraq War, we think of all the examples uh, that Sean walks us through happening today. Um, but when it fails, it also fails spectacularly. Um, and here, if the benchmark is not uh, is stopping Russia from invading Ukraine, it failed, if that's the benchmark, for collective security arrangements. Ironically, Russia was sitting in the chair uh, of the Security Council when it undertook this invasion. Um, when we look at the regional level, of course, NATO is our regional collective security arrangement. If the benchmark is stopping Russian aggression in Europe, well, NATO failed there too. Again, not really through any fault of its own, but structurally it was fated to. Um, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Article 5 wasn't triggered. No NATO states were invaded. So what can NATO do? It can offer assistance, and it has done that, uh, but it's not going to be able to stop Russia from doing what it's doing. And then on the local, the very specific level, the collective security arrangement was, of course, the Budapest Memorandum, the grand deal in 1994, where Ukraine gives up its nuclear arsenal that it inherited from the Soviet Union in exchange for security, it thought, right? The United States, uh, Russia, and the United Kingdom uh, gave security assurances uh, to Ukraine in exchange for giving up those nukes. Well, after Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, that left the United States and Britain explaining to Ukraine the difference between assurances and guarantees. Uh, and there we have the complete failure of collective security uh, on that strand of public international law. What about international judicial process? That has been a grand success. Uh, Ukraine has really succeeded in launching a legal counterattack against Russia uh, in an array of international judicial mechanisms. We all know uh, of their success in the International Court of Justice actually securing provisional measures at warp speed for international law, right? Uh, we know about their success uh, in the European Court of Human Rights also against Russia mandating that Russia cease hostilities uh, and withdraw. Uh, cases also happening at the Law of the Sea Tribunal and the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, are successes. And then, of course, the International Criminal Court, uh, which you know, long has been criticized for its, its moribund rate of doing things, uh, again, has been moving at an incredible speed. Um, but that's really a, a function of happenstance. Uh, the prior prosecutor at the ICC had opened um, a preliminary examination uh, in Ukraine in response to Ukraine's request after Russia swiped Crimea. So this was laying around for a while. The books just hadn't been closed. Uh, so again, when, when Putin's tanks rolled into Ukraine, they rolled into an open preliminary examination. Uh, now, I'm sure that Vladimir Putin's lawyers in the Kremlin advised him he had immunity and impunity uh, with respect to the ICC. Um, to his great surprise, he does not. Uh, and that preliminary examination now has been converted into a full-blown investigation. And forensics teams are on the ground collecting evidence of war crimes now. A pre-trial panel has been uh, impaneled uh, with the power to collect evidence and ultimately issue uh, arrest warrants. Um, so Ukraine actually functioning in these international legal mechanisms where Russia is not even showing up to defend itself is a testament to Ukraine being a rule of law society 
using rule of law mechanisms. The symbolic value of that can't be lost on us. Uh, and you can measure the success by the continued support that Ukraine is getting from NATO and from the European Union, right? It's easier for them to embrace and support Ukraine if they are doing all of these rule of law things uh, and demonstrating that they know how to use the mechanisms and they're winning, right? So if Ukraine continues to win on the battlefield, which is what they're doing, and win spectacularly in international tribunals, which is what they're doing. Um, I think this is, this is a good road for them to be on and a hopeful one for the rest of us. Um, so with that framing, um, we'll go ahead and move into our next panelist. Yep. Thank you very much, Michael. Our next panelist is Rebecca Hamilton, Assistant Professor, American University, Washington College of Law. Professor Hamilton focuses on international security law, international law, and criminal law. She is the author of Fighting for Darfur, Public Action and the Struggle to Stop Genocide, which analyzes citizen activism and the effort to stop mass atrocities. Prior to entering academia, Professor Hamilton was a journalist for the Washington Post and Reuters, and has published her works in Foreign Affairs, The New Yorker, Foreign Policy, The Atlantic, International Herald Tribune, and The New Republic. She has also served as a lawyer in the prosecutorial division of the International Criminal Court, and has worked in the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Born in New Zealand, Hamilton completed her undergraduate studies in Sydney, Australia. She is a graduate of the Harvard Law School and the Harvard Kennedy School, and she, where she was a Knox Fellow. And she serves on the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law. Rebecca. Uh, thank you to everyone for pulling this conference together, and it's so nice to see so many of you actually in person instead of on a screen. As Sean's remarks highlighted uh, this morning and, and Michael emphasised as well, Russia's aggression in the region began more than 15 years ago, in fact, uh, with its incursion into Georgia and began in Ukraine with the 2014 annexation of Crimea which is to say that one of the reasons that we should be prosecuting this latest war of aggression in Ukraine is not simply because of what is happening now, but because of what happens when aggression is not prosecuted, when the international community gives an implicit or explicit green light to a repeat offender. The other reason, as the Ukrainian people are clearly articulating for themselves to the rest of the world that needs to listen. War crimes are devastating in Ukraine right now, but it is the crime of aggression that is hitting each and every single Ukrainian, not just now, but for generations to come. And so it is not enough for the Ukrainian people to say that the International Criminal Court can go forward and prosecute the war crimes that are happening. That deals with part of the picture, but not the full picture. So three weeks after the February invasion, Ryan Goodman and I published on Just Security a model criminal indictment of President Putin for the crime of aggression and based entirely on public sources. It wasn't comprehensive in its temporal scope or its range of perpetrators, but our goal was to show quickly and hopefully effectively how the law and the facts lined up. To be clear, for the purposes of the historical record, that if there is no effort to prosecute these harms, it won't be because it was a hard case, it won't be because it was difficult to get evidence. It won't be because this is in any kind of legal gray zone. It will be due to a lack of political will. With all that in mind, we use the most narrow definition of the crime of aggression that we have, uh, borrowing Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute, 
which is also consistent with the 1974 UN General Assembly definition uh, and helpfully had already been deemed satisfactory by Russia's now Deputy Permanent Rep at the UN, Gennady Kuzman. Aggression under this definition means, and I quote, the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or direct the political or military action of a state of an act of an aggression which by its character, gravity and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the UN Charter. So that is a high bar. On a tight turnaround and using only publicly available sources, we focused on laying out the evidence with respect to Putin's acts of initiation and execution, although we had no doubt that with, it, with additional non-public sources, we could also make the case with respect to both planning and preparation as well. The control aspects of the charge flow clearly from the constitution of the Russian Federation, granting Putin control over the armed forces and chairmanship over the Security Council. And this is obviously not simply paper control, it is control that he, through his words and actions, is exercising on a daily basis. In terms of the specific acts of aggression, we focused on three, though if we were drafting today, certainly more could be added. Firstly, the act of invasion. And remember, we are looking just in the first few weeks of the conflict. We had Russian troops crossing the Ukraine border from Belarus, heading towards Kyiv, seizing the Chernobyl exclusion area. They crossed from the northeast border to head towards Kharkiv and move from Crimea in the south towards Kherson, the area where one of the areas that we have just had this announcement of um, a so-called referendum today. The second act that we focused on was bombardment. Documentation from just the last week of February this year already met the standard for a manifest violation of the UN Charter with the shellings in Kharkiv, Kherson and Mariupol. And thirdly, attacks on Ukrainian armed forces. In the first 10 days of the invasion, more than 2,000 Ukrainian military targets were attacked by Russian forces, including military command systems, radar stations, planes, tanks and rocket launches. So we had this model indictment very early on to really put in shining lights, this case is there for the taking. And subsequently, the Open Society Foundations have gone on to elaborate and extend this temporarily as well as to other acts and to other perpetrators. And so the question before us is much less a legal one than it is a political one. As everyone in this room understands, the ICC does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression in this particular case. So we need another prosecutor who does. Jennifer is going to discuss uh, potential options for what an aggression tribunal would look like that could do this. But no matter which form this may take, the very discussion of the possible existence of an aggression tribunal will begin to build state practice around head of state immunity, the first claim that we can fully expect Putin would bring. Case law and practice on head of state immunity for international crimes like aggression is extremely limited because the reality is that the world has been and still is very wary of pursuing accountability for leaders responsible for the most egregious crimes. The mere consideration by legal departments and governments around the world will serve as an interpretation catalyst, to use Rebecca Ingber's terminology, uh, around these questions of, of head of state immunity. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that more in, in the Q&A. It's the paper that I've written uh, for this forum. Um, but I want to close with one final consideration. If this is prosecuted, and, and unfortunately it feels like a big if in this moment, but if it does happen, it will be the first aggression prosecution since Nuremberg. It will garner major worldwide attention. And so it will necessarily serve as 
an anchoring point for our understanding of what aggression looks like. If we think forward not only to subsequent prosecutions potentially at the ICC, but also in the mind of the general public. And this is why it matters, I think, that any tribunal that is established to prosecute aggression begins its work with the 2014 annexation of Crimea. I appreciate there are cost implications of doing so, but there are also non-financial costs of not doing so. As lawyers here, we fully appreciate that acts of aggression don't have to look like a full-scale invasion. But for the general public, if this high-profile prosecution starts the clock on February 24th, 2022, then a full-scale invasion will become the gold standard for what aggression looks like. A full-scale invasion will become the tripwire for public calls for accountability for aggression in any future situation. So to circle back finally to the initial point, Public demand is always going to be an essential ingredient of any prosecution aggression, the political will needed to get there. If we rely on elites, I believe the enterprise is doomed. Because even those that benefit politically from seeing a prosecution in one instance will be worrying, as the US government is worrying now, that supporting this one prosecution for aggression will set a precedent that could come back to bite them in the future. Persistent, high-profile, public demand for an aggression prosecution is absolutely necessi a necessity. It is unfortunately, though, still not going to be sufficient to reach this major turning point that we need to make for the Ukrainian people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Our next presenter is Lori Blank, clinical professor, Emory University School of Law. Professor Blank is a clinical professor of law and the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic at Emory University, where she teaches law of armed conflicts and works directly with students to provide international assistance to tribunals non-government organizations, militaries around the world on cutting edge issues of humanitarian law and human rights. Laurie is the co-author of International Law and Armed Conflict, Fundamental Principles and Contemporary Challenges in the Law of War. She is also the co-author of a multi-year project on military training programs in the law of war and the co-author of Law and War Training Resources for Military and Civilian Leaders. She is the author of numerous articles and opinion pieces on topics of law and armed conflict, including targeting and drone strikes, classification of armed conflict, implementation of, uh, implementation of the law of armed conflict during military operations, cyber war, law and legitimacy in armed conflicts. Before, becoming, uh, before coming to Emory, Lori was a program officer in the rule of law program at the United States Institute of Peace. Professor Blank has her JD from New York University School of Law, a master's in international relations from the Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins, and an AB in political science from Princeton. Lori. And, and have an informal chat with you all for our, is this on? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, I wanna thank um, Dean Scharf and um, the students for putting on really a fantastic event. It's really a treat to be back after um, several years. So, um, and so nice to see so many old and new friends. Um, I wanna start with a disclaimer. Um, as of two weeks ago, I am on a one-year leave of absence from Emory, um, serving as a special counsel in the Office of General Counsel at the Department of Defense. So I need to start by saying that my remarks here are in my personal capacity and are not on behalf of 
or represent the views of the Department of Defense or the US government or anybody else. They may not even represent my own views. Um, they're not on behalf of anybody. Um, so I'm going to turn to another um, entire feature of the international law that is uh, highly relevant in the conflict. Um, M Michael talked about two strands of law, and I'm going to um, pick up on that theme, but highlight a different concept of two strands of law and what um, Rebecca's been talking about in the context of aggression is, of course, the use ad bellum, which is the law governing the use of force. I'm going to add into our conversation here um, the law of armed conflict, the use in bello, which is the law governing how wars are fought. Um, which, of course, is another huge piece of the conflict. And one of the questions um, that was posed to me was, well, how are international conventions, international treaties functioning um, in the context of preventing, addressing atrocities in the context of this conflict? So the Geneva Conventions, which are... Um, you know, our foundational treaties in the law of war. They turned 73 last month. Um, the additional protocols, um, which um, expanded on the Geneva Conventions, turned 45 in June. So these are not um, newbies in the, in the world of treaty law. The law of war itself is several thousand years old. It's, it's as old as humans and entities that fight with each other. But um, nonetheless, we see um, there's a reason a lot of us work in this space, because even though we have lots of law and lots of old law, um, we also have lots of war and lots of fighting. So in the news coverage of the conflict in Ukraine, um, we all know there's a steady drumbeat of news about violations of international law. We have news about questions about aggression that Rebecca has talked about, about war crimes, about crimes against humanity. Um, and the obvious immediate response and question that has dominated so much of the news coverage and so much of the conversation is, how do we address violations that are happening? What do we do? How do we investigate them? How do we prosecute them? How do we hold, we, the broader international community, hold individuals and states accountable? Um, obviously, those are critical questions. I think we're going to hear a lot um, from Ambassador Von Skak at, um, in her talk about work that's being done in that area. But the role of international law, and particularly the treaties in the law of war space, is much broader than that. So one of the things I want to do in my few minutes here is to think about the role that international treaties, particularly the Geneva Conventions, can and do play um, in regulating the conduct of war and preventing atrocities in particular. So what do these treaties do? They set out rules for parties to a conflict to abide by, right? They mandate training, education, and dissemination about those rules and that conduct. They define crimes. They define violations of those rules. And they mandate investigation and prosecution or extradition um, of individuals who are suspected of being involved in violations. Each of these categories matters across this full spectrum where the law of war operates to create a comprehensive structure for regulating the conduct of hostilities and protecting persons during armed conflict. So as I said, we naturally and very importantly, hear a lot about accountability, but I want to think a little bit about what happens before that as well, just to flesh out the picture for all of us. So setting out rules. The Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols, and many other treaties set out both a framework for thinking about conduct during war and the protection of persons, and hundreds of detailed rules. They're not quite as thick as the um, the Journal of International Law that you have in front of you, but, but kind of close. Um, we have the four fundamental principles of the law of armed conflict, military necessity, humanity, distinction, proportionality, and we can think also as a framework about the basic structure of the four Geneva Conventions, each one protecting one category of persons based on the idea of who is most vulnerable and most in need of protection during wartime. 
Then we have rules, as I said, hundreds of rules. They define who is protected, the obligations of parties, the rights and protections of individuals, whether the wounded and sick, POWs, civilians, et cetera. They set out the conduct of hostilities, who and what is a legitimate target, what are the rules for planning and launching attacks, detention, who can be detained, where, what conditions, et cetera, um, and measures for um, discipline and accountability, fair trials, and so on. What role does this facet of treaties play in preventing atrocities? Well, it's the rule book, right? It's the core principles that guide action even and the core principles guide action even in the absence of a specific rule or prohibition. Are they sufficient? Well, there have been a variety of calls over the last 20 plus years for new treaties, new rules, but, and I sort of answered that this way in the past, what would you change if you wanted to have new rules, right? Would we give up distinction? Would we give up the idea of precautions, proportionality? The rules seem pretty comprehensive and the chance of an interstate agreement on new rules I think we can um, agree that is probably slim. Training, education, and dissemination. We can't just set out rules and then jump to accountability and say, here are rules, oh, look at all these violations. So we have to have, how do you train your forces? How do you disseminate the information to the civilian population? How do you train civilian leaders, right, in what the rules are? Um, so we can think there about how should training happen, for whom, by whom should training happen? These all matter critically for the role that international treaties play in preventing atrocities, right? Because they mandate instruction, training, dissemination, not just a book that, well, if you happen to read the book with the rules, then you know what they are, but everybody has to learn from the, 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 you know, the trigger puller on the front lines to those in the command authority. Is it sufficient? Well, again, it, it ranges across the board from countries with comprehensive, well-established systems of training to states that have more nascent programs for any number of reasons and really interesting questions about the training of armed groups and other non-state entities and there's lots of discussion out there. The third area is defining the crimes and here the drafters of the Geneva Conventions felt very strongly about including statements about what would be breaches of the conventions. You can't just set out the rules, you have to define what the breaches are, right? And so in the commentary, for example, it says, if the repression of grave breaches is to be universal, it's necessary to determine what constitutes them. So the Geneva Conventions include a system of grave breaches, listing the specific crimes considered to be the most serious violations. They reaffirm and reinforce this basic structure right, which is the idea of who's protected and then what acts against those protected persons would constitute violations. Um, it is a detailed and extensive catalog of crimes, um, whereas Layla, I know there's lots of talk about a convention on crimes against humanity, so is it totally comprehensive? I'll leave that to you. Um, and then finally, um, last thing, just to return to the topic of accountability, um, obviously, accountability is a very multi-layered scenario in the international system with international tribunals, national prosecutions, and all the varieties of in-between. Um, and the conventions contribute to this with, the, again, the grave breaches regime, which obligates states' parties to the Geneva Conventions to enact legislation to provide penal sanctions, search for persons, investigate, and either prosecute or extradite, and enact measures to suppress other violations. So that's our kind of framework for how it works, um, which I think there's lots of conversations to be had on how well um, and what other things could happen, but at least a starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Jennifer Trahan clinical professor, New York University's Center for Global Affairs. Jennifer is a clinical professor at NYU Center for Global Affairs and the director of their concentration in international law and human rights. She is a prolific scholar, having published two digests on the case law of the ad hoc tribunals, as well as scores of law review articles and book chapters, including on the International Criminal Court's Crime of Aggression. 
The book she has, uh, the book she has recently published is Legal Limits on the Security Council Veto Power in the Face of Atrocity Crimes, which was published uh, in the summer of 2020. She has also served as one of the U.S. representatives to the Use of Force Committee of the International Law Association and holds various positions with the American branch of the International Law Association. She also serves as an amicus curiae to the International Criminal Court on the appeal of the situation regarding Afghanistan and was named to the Council of Advisors on the application of the Rome Statute to cyber warfare. She recently became convener of the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression. Jennifer. Thanks, Stephen, for that. Um, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. So my remarks are going to discuss the reasons for establishing an international tribunal for the situation in Ukraine on the crime of aggression. So we've all been shocked by the severity and barbarity of the invasion with absolutely um, only the most facile pretext of conformity to international law. However, by now you know we do not have sufficient legal architecture to address the crime that is um, set off the entirety of the invasion, the crime of aggression. You know, the ICC can only investigate and prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, and if warranted, the crime of genocide. And yet we have to look back and see the words of the Nuremberg Judgment that it is the crime of aggression that is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And that is, what, why supreme? Because it sets off the entirety of what follows. So in each situation of war crimes, crimes against humanity being committed in Ukraine, we don't know what the prosecutor at the ICC or elsewhere will be able to prove. How far up the chain of command will they be able to go? And the totality of the crimes are never proven. And, you know, will it reach the highest levels? Um, but we do know the crime of aggression does because it is solely a leadership crime, the decision to initiate the invasion. And its victim base is much broader than that of any of the other crimes. It is not just the victims of war crimes and crimes against humanity occurring in Ukraine, but it is the totality of the killing. It is the totality of the harm. It is the killing of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers. It is even famine caused by blocked wheat shipments. So I'm going to step back and give a little historical background. Hopefully, I'm not overlapping too much with Beth's lunch presentation, um, but just to frame where this crime comes from. And there's a wonderful book on this, The Internationalist by Ona Hathaway and Scott Shapiro. I really commend it to you. So they trace initially in 1917, it's Americans who are leading the way on thinking about prohibiting aggressive war outlawing war. And they're thinking about the even more difficult topic, how would you enforce that? And it's somewhat humbling and incredibly concerning that over 100 years later, we haven't figured this out. An innovative moment is with the founding of the Peace Palace in The Hague. Um, those who, in the room who teach international law, which is most of, about half of the room, will know that even then we have the, the concept that one must arbitrate and litigate and not go to war, that states must utilize the Peace Palace. France and the U.S. then take a tremendous step forward in 1928 with the Kellogg-Briand Pact, renouncing aggressive war. Of course, that does not preclude the cataclysm that was World War II. In the London Charter that established the Nuremberg Tribunal, we have the historic decision, the crimes against peace, which is what they then called crime of aggression, would be covered, and they are actually the central focus of the Nuremberg prosecutions, counts one and two, 
of the indictment on aggressive war and conspiracy to commit the same. States then attempt to reinforce the same prohibition in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. It is our core central norm of the Charter. We even say it rises to the level of our highest level of norms, use Kogan's, and yet you know there is no automatic enforcement provision. Um, there can be uh, Chapter 7 UN Security Council repercussions, but when a permanent member is involved, obviously that entire process will be deadlocked, and we'll see what the General Assembly can do. I know a topic of one of our later panels. The UN General Assembly took another important step forward in 1974 when it defined aggression. And the ILA in the documents leading into what became the Rome Statute already have the crime of aggression in their drafts and early language that works its way into the definition. And then most in the room will know at Rome, we do have the historic decision. There are four crimes in the jurisdiction of the court but the definition is not concluded until about 2009 through the process of the Special Working Group on the Crime of Aggression and Jurisdiction is concluded in 2010 in Kampala, Uganda. But it is a limited jurisdictional regime, far more limited than the ICC's jurisdiction on war crimes, genocide, and the crime of aggression and crimes against humanity. And reflect, if it, it truly is the supreme crime, why does it have such a truncated jurisdictional regime? It is limited in 2010, both largely through the US and then 2017 through the UK and France. And there are incredibly rich ironies there that three of the four Nuremberg allies have limited the ICC's crime of aggression jurisdiction. So when the successor entity to the fourth Nuremberg ally, the Soviet Union, has now committed a massive invasion, the ICC doesn't have the jurisdiction. So in the long run, um, this crime belongs at the International Criminal Court. That is what was envisioned 1998 through all the negotiations on the definition. And there needs to be an amendment of the Kampala crime of aggressions jurisdictional regime. That will be difficult, however, to achieve, but must be done. In the meanwhile, we need a gap filler. We need a special tribunal for the crime of aggression created through the UN. Why, why is this needed? To put it starkly, nothing less than the global order is at risk. If one cares about the sanctity of borders, if one cares about Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, this is a global issue. And we will never know whether it was too tepid a response to the invasion of Crimea that got us where we are today. And we don't want too tepid a response now that fuels Chinese aspirations in the South China Sea and related to Taiwan. So the most legitimate way of doing this, the process is Ukraine would request the tribunal. Uh, the Ukrainians have expressed um, significant interest in proceeding in this route. Um, the UN General Assembly would need to recommend it, and this would set in place motions between the UN and Ukraine, uh, negotiating it through a bilateral treaty. So. Why does this need to be an international tribu uh, tribunal? Well, as mentioned, simply global orders at stake. This is not a European issue. This is not a regional issue. So our strongest statement is clearly an international one. And the UN General Assembly support would express this. Um, there are certain impediments with Ukraine's constitution in terms of a hybrid tribunal, certainly one established through um, the Ukrainian system. And fourth, it is the strongest response in terms of immunities issues. So the crime of aggression is a leadership crime. It only applies to certain political or military leaders. If you're going to have immunities, then you're going to have no prosecutions. So this is a significant impediment to prosecutions by Ukrainian or other domestic courts. And we really don't know in some type of hybridity or regional approach, we don't quite know in terms of the immunities questions. And this is maybe not kind of a, a good 
test case to figure out answers. So our strongest precedent, and we have very strong rulings on um, Jordan's failure to arrest uh, President Bashir of Sudan coming from the ICC, and the Sierra Leone Special Court ruling in the Charles Taylor case that even, and he was indicted while a sitting president of another state, uh, not of Sierra Leone, but of Liberia, and he did not have immunity. So we do have these strong rulings and we need to follow them. So I know I don't have too much time left, but I will just highlight some of the features um, of such a tribunal. Um, and I had the privilege, this is kind of a co-presentation. I've been working on this with Ona Hathaway, Astrid Reisinger, Corsini, David Sheffer, and Klaus Kress. And we had the privilege of presenting this at the Yale Club in June to UN member states um, sponsored by Liechtenstein and Latvia. Um, and there is a UN document. I have some copies for those who are interested, and we're, we now have a blog series running on the details of establishing the tribunal. They're running on just security. So um, we are proposing a fully international tribunal, but about the size of the Sierra Leone Special Court. So I think that's important to state because states will think international Yugoslavia and Rwanda, no. So really, it is a limited tribunal. Uh, why limited? It's doing one crime in one situation. Um, and But yet we feel very strongly that these need to be international judges. So as talented as Ukrainian judges might be, they will never be seen to be impartial um, in, in the eyes of the world. And this requires establishing um, the absolute um, strongest, and it, it has to be seen to be legitimate. Um, and really, an international tribunal is the only way this is going to be achieved. Um, it's temporal start date. Um, I fully concur with Rebecca that the crime started in 2014. Um, you know, the UN, um, there will always be contentious budget negotiations, and there will be some who will say, well, 2022 would capture, you know, at least this year. Um, so we leave that, those two. Um, the budget negotiations. Of course, there would be no temporal ending date because our crime is ongoing. Um, the definition should be the definition in Article 8 bis. I was there in the Princeton negotiations in the early 2000s with the Russian delegate um, who was party to all the negotiations and concurred with this definition, which was then adopted in Rome by consensus of at least all the Rome um, statute state parties and strong argument that it represents customary international law. Obviously, the tribunal needs to have the full panoply of fair trial protections. Um, I already discussed immunities. The statute can do this quite simply. Um, it simply says that head of state or uh, government official immunity is precluded before the tribunal. Um, and we basically have kind of boilerplate template language um, from uh, earlier tribunal statutes. This is not so difficult to do. The question is, as earlier alluded to, the political will. So we have tribunal language on what are the set of fair trial protections. It simply needs to create a, a, a witness protection program, details to be worked out when the tribunal gets operational. The tribunal should be located in The Hague so it can work in complement with the ICC and us other justice mechanisms. And I want to stress in complement with the ICC. It could even, for instance, share its premises um, and, um, you know, it is simply a gap filler, and the ICC actually should have every interest in this, this happening. I actually think there will be tremendous disappointment someday in the ICC when the world realizes they will do, I don't know, 5, 10, 12 war crimes cases, and the Ukrainians are, are going to be incredibly disappointed. Um, so I think the ICC should... Um, um, see this as complementing their important work. So these are just some of the key features. We've written about other ones. Um, this could be fairly easily established. It really comes down to political will. Um, all those 141 states that stood up for Ukraine in the UN General Assembly earlier this year in condemning the Russian invasion will now be put to the test, not to make hollow promises, but to enforce international law and individual criminal responsibility. 
We are facing a moment of deep crisis to the international legal order, and states need to step up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next presenter is Chiara Giorgetti, Professor, University of Richmond School of Law. Professor Giorgetti teaches and writes in the area of public international law, international arbitration, and international courts and tribunals. She has authored over a dozen publications on these topics, including authored and edited books. Professor Giorgetti served as a member of the Executive Council and Executive Committee of the American Society of International Law. Prior to joining the Richmond Law Faculty in 2012, Professor Giorgetti practiced international arbitration in Washington, D.C. and Geneva, Switzerland, and worked extensively with the United Nations in New York and Somalia. Professor Giorgetti clerked at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. She has her JD from the University of Bologna School of Law, uh, her Doctorate of Law from Yale University, her Master's of Law from Yale University, and a Master's of Science and Development Studies, London School of Economics and Political Science. So, Chara. Can you hear me like this? Yes? No? Shall I go up? No, okay. This works? Okay, yeah. good, great. Thank you very much. It's a really a pleasure uh, uh, being here today, and thank you, Dinshar, for, uh, for the invitation. This is a very timely uh, and uh, um, really much needed discussion. So as we, as we heard um, so far from other speakers, uh, on, 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 on February 24th, uh, the Russian troops entered um, the territory of Ukraine and committed a crime of aggression. And when they did that, they resulted not only in the commission of crimes of aggression, but they violated many different norms of international law and injuries and caused many, many different kinds of injuries to individuals, companies, and sovereign entities alike. And injuries included a massive displacement of people, enormous economic and personal harm, and widespread damages to public and private property, including infrastructures and cultural property. And as this audience uh, knows very well, a cardinal principle of international law is that its violations has consequences. And a state that violates international law must also provide reparations. So together with the creation, possible creation of an ad hoc tribunal on the crimes of aggression or other um, intervention by the ICC and other tribunals, I think we also need to look at the possibility of creating an instrument for compensation for injuries that resulted from the violations of international law, so monetary compensation. I have the honor to serve uh, in a working group that was established by President Zelensky in May 2002 with a mandate to develop and make proposal on the means and legal instruments for compensation for damages and, law and losses caused to Ukraine as a result of the armed aggression by, uh, by Russia, um, and uh, including reparations. Um, we have seen uh, that there are uh, cases, for example, the cases at the ICJ, uh, and um, coming from, for example, the case from Uganda, the DRC, it is possible that some compensation may be obtained by the ICJ, but that will be for very specific violations of the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide. And here what we've seen are injuries are much aware and are much, uh, much larger and unfortunately much more common also. So how can we create these instruments? How can we create a, 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 a compensation mechanism that, uh, that would uh, compensate the damages that were suffered uh, by the population and by, uh, by the state itself. In the moments that I have uh, in my remarks, I would like to look at why, how, and what, um, why we want to create a claims commission, how we can do it, and what would that mean. I have published also, <laughs> the Just Security seems to be very cited today, but I have published some of these remarks also on Just Security and was also published together uh, in, um, 
um, in Agile Talk together with Mark Jan Kuzlowski and Patrick Pearsall, who also serve um, um, in, the, um, in the working group. Um, so why a claims commission? Claims commissions can be created uh, ad, ad hoc, uh, a very flexible instrument, and can, target, can be targeted to very specific circumstances. They can be politically useful. They can also very often be better than alternatives that exist. Generally, they are created after upheaval, serious upheaval and war. And we have many recent examples. For example, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal that was created after the overthrow of the Shah in Iran. The uh, United Nations Compensation Commission was created in the aftermath of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. And the Eritrea-Ethiopia Claims Commission that was created uh, when, uh, after the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. And more recently, and maybe more uh, uh, sui generis, very much sui generis, is the registry for damages that was created uh, to record uh, claims in uh, the Palestinian occupied territories created in the aftermath of the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. And these claims commission are um, capable of resolving numerous and complex cases, and states must consider, may consider international claims commission necessary to ensure effective reparation for loss or damages, particularly following, as I mentioned, large-scale disruptions that generate mass claims from numerous individuals. So the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, for example, resolved more than 4,000 claims between the governments and nationals of Iran and the United States, and awarded over $2.5 billion in compensation to date still working uh, in The Hague. The United Nations Compensation Commission, or UNCC, resolved about 2.7 million claims, awarding compensation for 52, more than 52 billion dollars to approximately 1.5 million successful claimants. So as a flexible uh, instrument, International Claims Commission can also allow for a great variety of claims arising under different legal instruments. More specifically, a claims commission for Ukraine could serve three specific uh, purposes. One, it could collect, register, and assess, and eventually adjudicate claims for compensation, monetary compensation. It could preserve and collect Russian assets for paying awards. There are more than 200 billion assets that are, that are presently frozen that belong to our either the Russian state or Russian individuals connected uh, with the state. And three, providing a mean of enforcing awards and compensation. And to that end, an international agreement could establish a commission could provide a legal framework to allow contracting states to transfer blocked assets to a fund from which compensation will be paid. Um, so how could you then create this commission. The way in which the UNCC was created, the resolution from the Security Council, is not really an available option at this moment. There are alternatives. For example, in the past, international agreement between two states, so the EEC and the uh, Iran-US Claims Tribunal, was created in that way. This is not feasible also at the moment, might, might be in the future. The other venues, two in interesting venues. One is the role of the General Assembly, possibly under the Uniting for Peace resolution. We've seen that this has been an instrument has been used uh, quite substan substantially and, and well recently. Another is that the commission could be created by third states and other it could, be, uh, could be created as an international agreement concluded between Ukraine and interest states. And third states or other international uh, actors may help facilitate uh, international claims commissions, including through the negotiation, mediation, good offices, and the creation of a body itself. So possibly in conjunction with something else, in an international agreement and the General Assembly. And what would it mean? So I explored the why, I explored the how, and in the last two minutes that I have, what would that mean? Uh, another uh, important consideration is to identify the likely claimants. International claims offer really unique flexibility in this regard. Claimants can include states, natural and juridical persons, and international organization. And international claims may, be, may grant individuals direct and immediate access to file their own claims without the state acting on their behalf. 
Claims of individuals can be expedited and compensation can be made directly to them. And there, the example of the UNCC, for example, is a very good one. And the UNCC prioritized the approximately 1.5 million claims of individuals who had fled Kuwait following Iraq's invasion over larger and more complex claims filed by states, which were resolved later. And these smaller individual claims were heard through a mass claims process. And successful individual claimants receive fixed, though relatively modest, compensation, but in an expedite fashion. Similar here, the claimants, a, a, a commission uh, for Ukraine could address claims of states and natural and juridical persons, regardless of their nationality against Russia, arising from loss or damage suffered from international law, including um, international humanitarian law, use at bellum, and international economic law, as well as claims arising from investment, contracts, expropriation, or other measures. Um, the international agreement could establish a commission based in part on the models that I've explored, UNCC, Iran-US Claims Tribunal, and the Eritrea-Ethiopia Claims Commission. It would have jurisdictions to consider claims of different categories. The categories could have different bases, for example, the identity of claimants, individuals, uh, legal entities, or state, subject matter of claims, uh, such as those of personal injuries, economic injuries, or other types of injuries, or claims that will be adjudicated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, versus claims that we adjudicated on a collective mass claims basis. Uh, another uh, advantage of creating a claims commission is the possibility of creating mass claim processes that would expedite proceedings also. I look forward to talk, I think I have to wrap up unfortunately, but I look forward to, uh, to talking more and explore uh, this issue further in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chiara. Well, now we're going to move into the question and answer portion. And um, we do want questions from the audience. There are two microphones at each side. Uh, so I'm going to kick it off. I have, I have one question for each, but we do want to get to your question. So maybe I'll have to cut mine short. But Michael, uh, let me ask you this. How do you see the proceedings that are already instituted at the International Criminal Court unfolding? And what are the major challenges? Well, that's a whole nother panel. Um, and actually, before I get to that, uh, just by way of update, for those of you in the International Legal Academy, your phone's probably blowing up right now. I, I, this ticker from the BBC just came through. Ukraine's uh, President Zelensky uh, has requested fast-track NATO membership. Uh, in wake of the annexation of his territories. So, Michael, we do need another panel uh, uh, as this is unfolding. Um, I mean, it's not often that you're at a conference where international law is, this be, is being used in this way this quickly. Um, it's literally unfolding as we're talking about it. Um, with respect to your question, Steve, uh, on the ICC, um, the three judges who constitute pretrial chamber two uh, which is uh, uh, driving the, uh, the Ukraine situation right now, um, is an all-star bench. Uh, it's composed of Antoine uh, Casilla Mbe Mendua from the DRC, uh, who has deep experience drawn from previous postings at Rwanda and Yugoslavia war crimes tribunals, uh, Tomoko uh, Akane from Japan, uh, whose work on capacity building and legal systems, uh, in addition to prosecuting, really give her a keen eye toward process and procedure, and Rosario Salvatore Italia from Italy, uh, whose background in geopolitics and terrorism issues equip him to appreciate a much bigger picture in the Ukraine situation. Uh, this chamber will examine the evidence as it comes in, uh, approve cases within the Ukraine situation, um, and then issue summons or arrest warrants. Um, but remember, the ICC has backup jurisdiction. It, it has to you know, maintain the complementarity principle. So, you know, Ukraine will need to show that it, maybe it's unable to, to prosecute all of the war criminals as it gets more and more Russian POWs, and we saw a large number surrender in the last counteroffensive. There might just quantitatively be too many for Ukraine to handle. In that case, the ICC's backup jurisdiction can come into play. How many arrest warrants will we see? Will we see the big arrest warrant? Um, you know, against Vladimir Putin, like we saw against Omar al-Bashir in the Sudan situation? I have no idea. That depends on where the evidence leads. Um, and that also depends to a large extent um, on effectuating such a warrant, what happens in country. 
with Sudan, you know, the arrest warrant that was issued against Bashir progressively weakened him over time to the point that, you know, his country broke apart, he was overthrown, and then, you know, the successor government decides that it's willing to hand over, you know, the former despot who's sitting in jail in exchange for being reintegrated into the international political and economic order. Um, that's a chip they're willing to play. That requires the despot that's being overthrown to survive the overthrow process, which we didn't see with Gaddafi in Libya, uh, and then the successor government being willing to trade that despot if they survive the process for reintegration. Those are, those are a lot of dominoes that have to fall yet. Take our first question from the audience. Yes. Uh, um, Cody Corliss, and I'm an associate professor at West Virginia University College of Law. And until I just joined the faculty there, and previously I was a legal officer at the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Um, when we talk about, this is, I guess, specifically to Professor Traham, but I welcome other ideas from the, from the panel. We have this uh, clear crime of aggression, and you talk about the creation of an ad hoc tribunal. I struggle sometimes with how we get to actually the creation of this panel, of this ad hoc tribunal. And I wondered if you could really, you touched on it a bit in your talk, but I wonder if you could really lay it out step by step and how we can get there where, given Russia's status as a permanent member of the Security Council. Sure. Thanks for that. Yeah, we don't go to the security castle. That's, uh, that's step one. Um, it is usually set off by um, a letter from the country. So we see this with Sierra Leone and Cambodia. Uh, the government's request a tribunal. It's a letter to the Secretary General. Um, so <coughs> Sierra Leone, then the recommendation came from the Security Council, but it wasn't Chapter 7, and Cambodia was through the General Assembly. So then we know that can trigger the negotiations. So then it would be bilateral negotiations between the UN and Ukraine, just as we had with Sierra Leone and U the UN and Cambodia and the UN, and they agreed to the treaty. Um, and um, you know, I think we don't follow the Cambodia model. So there's been a lot of you know log jams and blockages from um, from the government there. And it was also established within the Cambodian system, um, and that poses um, constitutional issues for Ukraine. So it would not be. It would look much more like the Sierra Leone Special Court, particularly in size. Um, and you know, I think uh, David Crane's group, a global accountability network, has replicated the Sierra Leone Special Court statute, and I think that's a, a decent starting place. Um, our group is conceptually somewhat different in that we just say it, it has to be international, so kind of the size of the Sierra Leone Special Court, but um, not a hybrid, because in the eyes of the com international community, Ukrainians will never seem neutral, so talented as they may be, we need to go with purely international staff. But I think those are the trigger steps. And then the key question is really, do you have the UNGA vote? Um, and, you know, and that is where it's really important um, that we bring in, um, you know, states from around the globe um, to, to, and, you know, incorporate them, um, because I think there is some concern that, you know, this is seen as like a NATO and a European war, and it's really, you know, their problem, not ours. Um, but, you know, to me, every state has an interest in ensuring the sanctity of its borders. I mean, when you can brazenly invade your neighbor, then no states are secure. So I, I think we very much need to um, expand the dialogue and look for actual leadership from, um, you know, though additional regions really impressing on this issue. Um, so I think that's maybe not what we have yet achieved, and that's where it needs to go if you're going to get the vote in the General Assembly. Great, Dan. Thank you. Now, what I, we're running quickly running out of time, but why don't we do this? We have three questions from the audience. Uh, each of you state your questions, and we'll try to get through them uh, within the time we have. So please. I don't know how to make my question short, but. <laughs> Uh, I hope justice for Ukraine looks better than justice for Poland. Um, when we look back at the Second World War, and Poland was divided between um, Stalin and um, uh, uh, Hitler, 
um, the territory that uh, fell in, uh, um, into control of um, Stalin regime uh, also had a um, uh, atrocities that were committed by NKVD. And uh, it was uh, mass executions from uh, probably like 15,000 to 22,000 uh, Polish uh, soldiers, um, policemen, and intelligentsia. And um, during the Nuremberg Tribunal, what happened uh, was some Soviet prosecutor actually um, charged seven um, ge uh, German generals for that crime that uh, they were completely, um, you know, not guilty of. And uh, Germans were the first one who actually uncovered this mass graves in cutting that, um, you know, the, the, the executions that took place there. And um, till now, uh, Poland cannot get this crime classified as genocide. So um, it's not classified as genocide, it's not classified as crime against humanity, and neither is justified as the war crimes. The only uh, classification uh, that uh, current Russian government would agree to uh, would be military crimes and uh, cannot be prosecuted because it has been a long time ago and no one was charged and the case is closed. So um, I don't know if that's exactly a question, but um, how would you make someone accountable when um, they don't even want to classify something the, the way it should be classified? David as well as an international uh, trade advisor, weekend warrior with the Coast Guard. Uh, and I have been asked by the Coast Guard to put together a panel uh, or discussion regarding Russia and this particular um, conflict. Uh, that isn't really the question, though, but it's uh, part of your answer will be. And my question is this. Uh, what is your presumptive conclusion with respect to this particular conflict? Uh, crisis or war, let's call it a war, what is a presumptive conclusion of this war that would enable you uh, to uh, uh, initiate the actions that you have articulated today against Putin? Okay, thank you, David. Question over here. Hi, great panel, uh, Leila Sadad. Thank you so much. Um, just a, just maybe one comment and then uh, a question for the panelists. Um, the comment really responds to Lori's question about crimes against humanity. It's not a branch of IHL. It's a branch of international criminal law applicable in peace as well as in war. So if one cares about prevention of atrocities as well as punishment of atrocities, it's really critical to bring in a peacetime crime that uh, that deals with mass atrocities. Atrocities. And that kind of brings me to my question, because when I hear everybody has made a superb case for why the particular conflict in Ukraine uh, raises the necessity for global action, whether it be prosecution of aggression or prosecution of, of other crimes. At the same time, one of the reasons that the Special Tribunal for Aggression and other elements are being met with a certain degree of stony silence from many states is that there was another unlawful use of force by another superpower in 2003, and that was the invasion of Iraq. And you hear that all the time. When I'm trying to work on my projects, you hear constantly thrown back at you the question of Iraq. And I think until we have a more fulsome discussion of why this is different, or perhaps it's not different, and there should have been accountability in that particular case, I think you're constantly, especially Jennifer, your project is going to fail because nobody is going to support it unless there's some kind of response to why now and why is this different. And, and I just think that's a global reality that here in the United States we have a little bit of blinders about um, and needs to be taken up and, and, and looked at in a much more serious fashion. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm I was just reminded that we're actually over time, so uh, what I have to do is I'll ask one of the panelists here to try to summarize these three questions uh, with a very lucid and dynamic response. <laughs> and, 
Which one of you would like to tackle that? Jennifer, go. Yeah, yeah. suicide mission here. Okay, in like one minute. Um, so Catch and Forest Massacre, obviously war crimes, crimes against humanity. Um, not acknowledged. Um, this may not sound fully satisfying, but when most of your perpetrators are dead, um, I think you turn to a truth commission uh, or an unofficial truth commission, and you, you know, um, NGOs or um, the the government in Poland draws much more attention to this, and it may, you know, just at least get much more acknowledgement. If they're still living perpetrators, maybe you can have trials. Um, how do you get Putin? Um, you know, um, so the tribunal we're proposing is not waiting um, until, you know, it, 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 we had this theory, you have to have peace first and then you do justice, and that was a theory in Afghanistan, and then we waited, you know, decades for peace and there was never justice. So, um, so the tribunal simply proceeds, and you never quite know how these things unfold. So many years ago, I was at Human Rights Watch working on the Arrest Karadzic and Mladic campaign. And at that point, we were like, we have no idea how we'll, this person will end up in The Hague. And then we had the arrest of Milosevic, and we're like, we had no idea. And then we're looking at Charles Taylor, who was at one point in Nigeria, and we're like, but it's not under Chapter 7. There's no obligation to surrender. So, you know, at the time, it seems impossible. Um, you know, so I think you, you establish the tribunals. I mean, this is high-level political and military leaders. It's not there to get Putin. It is the high-level political and military leadership that satisfies the clause and meets, falls within the definition. So there are others. Um, and, you know, um, who maybe take a vacation in Europe and lo and behold, there's a sealed indictment or something like that. So I, I, it's not, not only about that, but even the issuance of an indictment is a huge, I think, starts to put political pressure um, at maybe contributing to regime change. Layla has, of course, asked me the most difficult question. Um, and, and this does come back, and I think we, we do struggle with it because, and this is maybe why we don't see the global south hopping on board, is because they see hypocrisy. And this is why I say in the long run, this always belonged at the International Criminal Court. We didn't want ad hoc solutions. We wanted a global answer. And I think we have to stress, um, as I know uh, Judge Chile emphasizes always that it is the Rome statute that at heart needs to be fixed so that we can have um, more even application. Um, in terms of, yeah, this would be a selective response, but I'm like, if we don't respond to this, then what is the purpose of the crime? But I think it also sets important precedent. Um, I might slightly differentiate uh, Gulf War II, uh, which had some legal theories. Um, I, don't, I didn't think they were particularly in incredible, but John Bellinger has presented the cogent arguments of the relationship back theory. Um, I'm not sure that wins the day. Um, I don't think Russia in this situation really has any viable legal theories, but I don't really want to make that differentiation. I think in the end of the day, we want no flagrant or manifest violations of the UN Charter. Thank you, Jennifer. Quick, quick response. <laughs> Chiara wanted three <laughs> seconds, so go ahead. Yeah. Surprise, if you want to know the answer, talk to me at coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Back to you, Michael. Okay, hey, by the way, thanks for our panelists. Okay, okay. You know, the, the mark of a great panel is when there are so many questions and so many discussion points that you don't want to end on time. But we are 10 minutes over, and we want to keep everything going because we don't want to cut into some other really great panels. So let's. Uh, it's, it's currently 10 after 11. Let's convene again at 20 after 11. Please be here right on time because the panel will begin. That's the panel that goes from the Ukraine, the micro to power shift, the macro questions here. All right, see you in 10 minutes.